Good evening and welcome. My name is Nicola Longford. I'm the executive director of the Sixth Floor Museum. Thank you all so very much for coming here tonight to be part of a highly stimulating program featuring our very special guest, Max Holland. And it's wonderful to see familiar faces and some dear friends to the museum here this evening. Many of you know that the museum is steadily changing, transforming and growing. And I would like to thank all of you who have helped play and continue to play a pivotal role in this critical process. Five years ago in late June 2010, the museum opened the reading room in the first floor of the former Texas School Book Depository building in a space once called Suite 120. This was a space that was very dreary and rather non-functional in design. Most of the fabulous south-facing windows overlooking Dealey Plaza were blocked with office carol walls, except for what was once my office. Before we opened the reading room in 2010, Suite 120 housed various offices for senior staff and the rest of the poor souls on staff, more than 20 people, were squeezed into a very nasty, unfinished space in the basement of our visitor center. These are spaces that none of you ever really see. And this space fortunately was renovated last year. But as part of our strategic one facilities plan, in 2008, we consolidated all our offices, the back of house functions of the museum, into one main location across the street in the 501 Elm Building, which is also a historic building. And to my immense pleasure, everybody's temperament here at work, um, there was a serious commitment to work, and uh, the approach here vastly improved. But we set to work immediately once we moved over our offices into the 501 Elm space to develop a serious, quiet, but very open, transparent space that was dedicated to providing students, teachers, researchers, scholars, and filmmakers access to our growing collections, library, and archives. We also created a special reading room reserved for interviews for our expanding oral history project, and now we hold close to 1,400 interviews. Some of you here in this audience today have contributed to this important documentary record, so thank you all very much. However, our very first researcher to the reading room in 2010 was Max Holland. So Max, back there, huge thank you to you for being number one and for still sticking through with us all along the way. Max Holland is a prolific writer, author, journalist, and noted assassination scholar. He is the editor of Washington Decoded, an online newsletter, and he is currently contributing editor to The Nation and the Wilson Quarterly. He also sits on the editorial advisory board of the International Journal of Intelligence and Counterintelligence. Max's numerous articles have appeared in periodicals and journals such as Newsweek, The Atlantic Monthly, American Heritage, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Los Angeles Times, The Boston Globe, The Baltimore Sun, Studies in Intelligence, and the Journal of Cold War Studies, Reviews in American History, and Online History News Network. And he's published many books. I won't go over the very long list, but he's got an upcoming one called A Need to Know Inside the Warren Commission. He's also been the recipient of many accolades and awards. And in 2011, he was the lead consultant for a National Geographic television documentary, JFK, The Lost Bullet, which is about the Kennedy assassination. I really can think of no one better in this field um, of specialized research to talk about the subject of tonight's program. Max, please come on out. We are truly honored uh, to host you here this evening. And I can honestly say that you've been nothing but a delight to work with. And this comes from all of my staff who have had the privilege of interacting with you in various ways. We really have a super team here at the museum. And I'm privileged to work with all of you. And it makes it even better and more rewarding when we all enjoy working with our special guests. So please join me in welcoming Max Holland for his presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> a couple of days ago, I figured out when I first came to Dallas as a journalist interested in the assassination, it was 19 years ago, almost to this day. I didn't know what to expect. In fact, I'd been warned by a friend who worked, had worked for the Dallas Times Herald that people don't like to talk about the assassination. But after they took my measure, I received enormous cooperation from people who'd been in the FBI, the Dallas Police Department, 
the U.S. Attorney's Office, anybody I really wanted to talk to about that weekend. I have many indelible memories of those interviews, and I've made many friends in the ensuing years. <clears throat> but I quickly developed two ambitions. One was to give a talk at the Sixth Floor Museum, having something important to say that I hoped would be worth an invitation. And the other was to stay at the Adolphus Hotel instead of the Hotel Lawrence. And I feel I have arrived because Nicola has made both of those things possible. <clears throat> and her superlative staff. I've worked with many of them for years and have gotten to know more on this trip. My topic is the Zapruder film. And the question is, what more is there possibly to say about that film? Iconic is a very overused word these days, but if it has any meaning at all left, it applies to the Zapruder film. It surely is, because it's hard to overestimate how six feet of eight millimeter, eight millimeter film has penetrated the collective consciousness. It's been the subjects of books, movies, plays, doctoral theses, performance art, fine art, and parody. Zapruder is even a verb now. It means to undergo a transformation whereby the images that were once descriptive, anchored in what they showed, have been loosened from their chains and set out on unending journeys that per perplex and fascinate. Perhaps the p most poignant observation I've ever heard, though, is that no matter how many times you view the film, when you see it, you look at it hoping against hope that this time, somehow, JFK is going to make it through unscathed. Of course, he never does. Now, let me say at the outset, this is an extremely complicated story with lots of twists and turns over 50 years, and I'm going to have to skip over many details and many of the twists, partly uh, because I have a limited amount of time, but also <clears throat> I don't want to bore you to death. Um, I have this recurring nightmare that someday I'm going to turn into one of those people in Dealey Plaza who has laminated photographs trying to persuade everyone of my view of what happened. We're going to start with Life magazine, the issue that was dated December 6, 1963. The magazine, or the Time Life parent corporation, had just purchased the Zapruder film, all the rights to the film, for $150,000, which is still a lot of money, but in 2015 dollars, it was $1.2 million. Now life wanted to do something that it felt it could because of its exclusive access to the Zapruder film, and that was to answer some of the questions that were being raised about the feat of arms supposedly accomplished by Lee Harvey Oswald. Now this was a legitimate journalism project. Hugh Ainsworth of the Dallas Morning News did something roughly comparable when he investigated whether it was possible for Oswald to have gotten from the sixth floor of the school book depository to the Texas theater. That was a very important finding. And Life <clears throat> was trying to assure Americans that yes, indeed, Lee Harvey Oswald had been able to kill the president. Now, for younger people who are here, and I'm not sure I see that many, uh, you know, life's influence at the time was the equivalent of what we, what we would call a, a, a viral mem on the internet today. It was a media colossus, very influential, the most influential magazine of its time with a readership of about 40 million people. And the significance 
of it coming out with this story was immense because Life magazine declared that the Zapruder film was nothing less than a time clock of the assassination. It told us exactly what happened and when. As one scholar of the Zapruder film, Art Simon wrote, it was of profound importance that Zapruder's images first found public exposure in Henry Luce's picture magazine. Here it was implied that images nearly spoke for themselves, that knowledge, perhaps truth, was ensured by the camera. The defining concept for the magazine, its own enabling fiction, asserted that the photograph, not the word, was the privileged signifier. The article that I'm talking about was entitled End to Nagging Rumors, the Six Critical Seconds, and it set our parameters for understanding the Zapruder film, or as Life would later put it in 1966, of all the witnesses to the tragedy, the only unimpeachable one is the eight millimeter film made by Abraham Zapruder, which recorded the assassination in sequence. Now, Life's account was very specific. The first shot was fired at what was <clears throat> labeled Zapruder frame 190. All the frames had been numbered sequentially. The second shot was fired 4.1 seconds later and hit Governor Conley, the first shot having hit the president. The third shot hit the president at Zapruder frame 313 and was obviously fatal. Now this frame actually didn't appear in the magazine because part of the understanding with Zapruder was the frames would only be tastefully selected and shown. So this frame was not actually in the magazine. The total time of the shooting sequence was 6.8 seconds, although life reduced it to six. But what was really significant about this article is that Mark the beginning of the privileging of the Zapruder film over all the other evidence, treating it as more crucial perhaps than even the post-mortem of the president. This was a conceit put forward by life and never really questioned. As the cliche goes, seeing was believing, or perhaps believing and knowing just consisted of seeing. The film was so spellbinding that everything else could be dismissed or discounted. For example, this was the view from the window at Z frame 190. You would hardly think this would be the time that Oswald would fire the rifle when the president is almost completely obscured by the oak tree. But life didn't know this because they didn't go up to the window. They wrote the article from New York. <clears throat> now, there's no question that the Zapruder film was as in, and is important and an invaluable piece of information. But it cannot be viewed in isolation, I would argue, as if nothing else matters. In fact, this also marked the time when the film was something of a Rorschach test. It really reflected the point of view and the knowledge and the understanding of the person or persons who viewed it rather than being an, treated objectively as a piece of the overall mosaic. Now the CIA, FBI, and Secret Service had copies of the Zapruder film and they were looking at it too. And they weren't bound by life's interpretation, but they were influenced by it. They also privileged it above other evidence. They weren't quite aware of all the totality of the evidence. The FBI was the body charged with preparing a report for the Warren Commission, and therefore its analysis of the film was the one that counted for the commission. They didn't put the first shot at frame Z90 for the obvious reason the president was obscured. So their finding was that it wasn't 6.8 seconds, it was only six. As they said in their January 64 report to the Warren Commission, the best estimate of the time interval the shots fired is that approximately six seconds elapsed from the first shot to the final shot. But again, the sequence was the same. The president was hit, Governor Conley, and then the president fatally. This was also reflected in the model. There were no computer-generated graphics 
at that time, of course, so people built models to develop understanding of complex events. And this was the model delivered to the Warren Commission in January 64. And you can see three strings from the window to, <clears throat> to the cars below, marking the exact times that the FBI estimated the shots, three shots, had been fired. And this model is on the sixth floor today. Now the Warren Commission comes along and by April realizes there is a big problem with the scenario depicted by the FBI. As Norman Redlick put it in a memo to J. Lee Rankin, the facts which we now have in our possession submitted to us in separate reports from the FBI and Secret Service are totally incorrect and if left uncovered will present a completely misleading picture. And what he was talking about was the fact that the FBI had established that you could reasonably fire the Manlicker Carcano used by Oswald twice in a period of about 2.3 seconds. You needed that much time. And that was equivalent to 42 frames of the Zapruder film. The problem was there weren't 42 frames between when the president was in obvious distress and when Governor Connolly was in obvious distress. So what did that mean? That meant either they were shot separately by two gunmen, which is the definition of a conspiracy to be sure, or else, just possibly, one bullet passed through both men. So the Warren Commission began to explore this possibility. They hadn't even anticipated coming down to Dallas and restaging the assassination, but they did so with the FBI's help in May 1964. And it was for the express purpose of either confirming or, or not being able to corroborate, uh, corroborate what was called the single bullet theory, or as I prefer to call it, the single bullet conclusion. And here you have Arlen Specter, and I've tried to outline the line in green of the bullet that hit President Kennedy in the upper back exited his throat and then hit Governor Connolly. The ammunition Oswald had used was military ammunition, which meant it was jacketed. It was made, according to the Geneva Convention, to pass through people. That was considered more humane on the battlefront. And when you think about it, of course the same bullet had to hit both men because a real magic bullet would have been one that entered President Kennedy's upper back at 1,900 feet per second, exited his throat at 1,700 feet per second, and then disappeared, which is the only other explanation because nobody else in the car was injured, there was no other injury in the car. So when the Warren Commission decided the single bullet theory explained what happened, that left the proposition that if one shot hit both men and one shot had hit President Kennedy in the head, one shot was unaccounted for. Well, how important was it? It didn't hit anybody. It didn't hit a VIP, I should say, in Dealey Plaza. So how much did it matter? The fact is they didn't give it much thought. It was a pesky problem. They ran out of time. So in the Warren Commission's conclusion, they say that one bullet hit both the president and the governor, another hit the president in the head, and one missed. And they didn't even know whether it was the first of the three shots that had been fired, the second, or the third. And as they put it, a wide range of possibilities precludes a conclusive finding. They didn't think it was that important to determine. But their, the reasoning they presented was ironclad. It's sort of a model of legal reasoning. They went through all three possibilities. The third shot was the one that missed. Now that makes the most sense because the president would be farthest away. However, virtually all the testimony was that the shot to the president's head was the third and final shot. So there wasn't much credibility attached to that possibility. 
It also didn't seem too plausible that Oswald, who hit the president in the back at about 190 feet and in the head at 265 feet, had missed him entirely on what would have been the closest shot. That didn't seem to make sense either. So without being terribly explicit about it, the Warren Commission suggested it was the second shot that was the one that missed. This meant that three shots were fired in 4.8 to 5.6 seconds. Now the reason they had that variable factor in there was that for about a second, President Kennedy is obscured by what was then the Stemmons Freeway sign. And we don't quite know, or we didn't think we knew then exactly when he was hit. So that was three shots in less than six seconds. So a cohesive, single, compelling explanation of how the president had been murdered was not in the Warren report. Of course, it had only happened one way. It doesn't happen a different way every time you see the Zapruder film. But the Warren Commission could not come up with that one way. So the film, the early promise of which was that it was going to tell us exactly what happened, the film didn't fulfill that promise. It was still privileged, however, over all, nearly all the other evidence. But this uncertainty over how was actually a very volatile issue, given the other questions about Oswald, the fact that he lived in the Soviet Union, that he visited Mexico City a month before the assassination, visited the Cuban embassy. These things created a lot of controversy. And within two years of the Warren Report's publication in September 64, it was, quote, a matter of reasonable doubt whether Oswald had acted alone, based on questions about how. This prompted CBS, which was the Tiffany of the news networks at the time, to launch probably the most extensive and best re-examination of the assassination that has ever taken place, certainly by a news organization. It started in the fall of 1966 and was aired, if you can imagine, on four successive nights in June 1967. The first program was two hours, and the programs after that were three hours. So it was an extraordinary devotion of time to this issue. Now, CBS did something the Warren Commission did not do. They went up to a ballistics laboratory in Maryland, H.P. White Laboratory, and they had them construct a replica of the shooting situation that Oswald had encountered. In other words, they replicated the elevation, the speed, and the distance that Oswald had to master for his feat of marksmanship. The Warren Commission had actually conducted firing tests through the FBI on stationary targets, not a moving target. Now, to be sure, it wasn't moving that fast, 11 miles an hour by most estimates. Nonetheless, there's a big difference between a moving target and a stationary target. And what CBS found is that the implied best explanation of what happened, three shots in 5.6 seconds, could not be done by expert marksmen. The commission's account required Lee Harvey Oswald to outperform experts at their own trade. It was the rare marksman who could fire three shots in less than six seconds, and most of them took far longer, up to 8.25 seconds. In 17 out of 37 attempts, 46% of the time, marksmen were unable to get off three shots and sometimes even two. And we're not even talking about hitting the target. We're just talking about getting the shots off. So CBS established that the scenario that the second shot was the errant shot was not true. And if the third shot was not the Aaron shot, that left only the possibility that the first shot, counterintuitively, was the one that missed. CBS was the first to state this unequivocally. Now we're going to fast forward about 30 years to what I would call the rational 
caucus about what the shooting sequence was. These are authors like Gerald Posner, Larry Sturdivan, who is a wound ballistics expert, Vincent Bugliosi, and Dale Myers, who worked with ABC on a very good 30th anniversary investigation that Peter Jennings uh, anchored. Now you'll see that they all now have the assassination taking as long, uh, well, in excess of eight seconds. They all have the second shot at about Zapruder frame 223 or 222. And the other thing that's true about this consensus is there is less time between the first and second shot and the second and third. What all these scenarios were saying, in effect, was that as the president was going under the tree, Oswald fired the first shot, and that a branch of the tree probably deflected it. There was no actual test of this proposition, and in fact, the tree had been examined very carefully, and no evidence that it had ever deflected a bullet existed. But nonetheless, this was the accepted consensus of the rational caucus. And I would freely admit that I accepted it too. I thought it was the best explanation. The first shot was deflected by a tree branch. As soon as the president cleared the tree, shots two and three occurred. This consensus also reflected the fact that the assassination had become fused with one representation, so much so that Kennedy's death was unimaginable without the Zapruder film. It was still functioning as a Rorschach test. You still saw in the film the information that you brought to it. The problems with the consensus were these. There was really no good answer to why Oswald had missed so badly on the first shot. Because remember, not only did he miss the president, he missed everybody in the car. He missed the car. Now this was a car that was 20 feet long and maybe 90 feet away, which probably qualifies as the broadside of a barn. But he missed it. Now there is a phenomenon known as buck fever among hunters in which they're so excited and they have such an easy shot that they miss it. And some people believed it wasn't the branch, but it was a case of buck fever. But there was another problem too, which was that two ballistic phenomena associated with the first shot were not really explained very well by the consensus that existed in the late 1990s and 2000. One was there was a concrete skirt on Elm South Side of Elm Street in which several witnesses had seen a burst of debris. And there are pictures after the assassination of several law enforcement officers, you know, picking at the ground there, looking for something. There's also the matter of James Tay, who was standing on the on North Commerce Street, and he was discovered afterwards by a policeman to have a cut on his cheek. And he led the policeman to where he had been standing, and the policeman promptly discovered a fresh mark on a curb, a fresh bullet mark. Finally, there was the issue that the timing of the consensus contradicted most of the ear witness testimony. Of those people that heard three shots in Dealey Plaza, more than 60% thought there was more time between shots one and two than between two and three. That's the exact opposite of the consensus view. <clears throat> now in 2007, I interviewed Wynne Lawson, who's the man here in the circle. And he has borne one of the heaviest burdens of all in the wake of the assassination. He advanced for the Secret Service President Kennedy's trip to Dallas. In fact, he was in the lead car with Chief Curry and Sheriff Decker. And I wanted to talk to him about the debate over a motorcade in Dallas, because he was privy to those meetings conducted on Monday between the Kennedy and Connolly forces. 
Connolly did not want a motorcade in Dallas. He was afraid that someone would throw a tomato or an egg at the president. There'd be another untoward incident a month after the Stevenson affair. The Kennedy forces just as vigorously wanted a motorcade. If there wasn't a motorcade in Dallas, tech, Dallas would be the only Texas city that didn't have a motorcade. It would suggest the president was maybe a little skittish about being in Dallas. It was also a big issue over the trademark luncheon. Most of the people invited there hadn't voted for Kennedy and wouldn't be voting for him in 1964. So the Kennedy people wanted an event where the average citizens in Dallas could see the president. And of course, motorcades were Kennedy's signature. That was a favorite thing that he did while campaigning. And finally, some of Dallas's city fathers also wanted a motorcade because they saw it as the fastest way to repair the black eye that Dallas had suffered as a consequence of the Stevenson incident. So the, the outcome of that meeting was leaked by the Kennedy people. It was leaked to a Dallas Times Herald reporter named Jim Lehrer, who published one of the first articles about the fact that there was going to be a motorcade through downtown Dallas. And he didn't describe the route exactly, or there wasn't a map, but he did describe it roughly in words. And there was an inveterate newspaper reader who worked at the Texas School Book Depository, who often read the newspapers, because he was too cheap to buy his own, in the lunchroom. And he thought he was a world historic figure. And here he was being presented with the possibility of committing a world historic act. Well, I was talking to Wynne Lawson, and my intent was to find out about this difference, this tussle between the political forces. And without my prompting, he said, you know, I don't care what anybody thinks. There was more time between the first and second shot than between the second and third. And I said, you know, I've read that in most of the testimony. I understand that. And then I quickly tried to steer the conversation to what I was interested in, which again was this political tussle. But after I hung up, somehow it bothered me that he was so insistent about that one fact. Now let me just say one more thing about Wynn Lawson. <clears throat> After the assassination back at Secret Service headquarters, agents actually came up to him and said, if it had to happen, I'm glad it happened on your watch. And I thought that was the cruelest thing I had ever heard. But it was meant as the highest compliment, because everybody knew that if Wynn Lawson had advanced President Kennedy's trip, that every T had been crossed, every I had been dotted. He had done nothing wrong. And if the problem, and if obviously there was a problem, it was not in the procedures that were or were not followed. It was in the whole idea of having a president drive through a downtown area in an open car. Probably the first thing I did after Wynne said that to me is I called Larry Sturdivan, who was a prominent member of the consensus. I said, you know, Larry, I've read this, and I just had this interview, and it bothers me that, you know, so many people said there was a pause between the first and second shot, and all the, you know, your scenario and Posner's, et cetera, uh, have the opposite. And Larry said, well, you know, it's a traumatic event. People aren't tape recorders. You know, so they're just wrong. And of course, there's lots of testimony that's just plain wrong. Still, it bothered me. And for the first time, I started doing a little calculating of my own. I had never delved into the, you know, this is this, this is a pruder frame, so and so, and the arithmetic of it. That wasn't my interest. And then I remembered something about the Zapruder film, which is frequently overlooked. The film is 26.5 seconds long. The first 7.2 seconds are just motorcycle policemen driving by. Zapruder stopped his film because he didn't know how much film he had left in his camera. He had, it wasn't a new role. And he waited until he could see the president clearly. So the first frame of the Zapruder film that actually shows President Kennedy 
in his specially designed Lincoln Continental is frame 133. Now, if you took, you remember in the consensus view, the first shot is roughly 157 or 160. Just for argument's sake, you went all the way and just said the first shot had to be at 133. The best you would get is three almost exactly equally spaced shots. And when I realized that, I realized that if Win Lawson were right, the first shot would have to ha would have had to have happened off the Zapruder film. And I actually remember experiencing vertigo, because how can something happen off the Zapruder film? I mean, that's practically un-American. As one of the scholars of the Zapruder film wrote, the film is a holy relic of presidential martyrdom, a document of the last moments of American idealism and innocence, a testament to government ineptest at best and nefarious conspiracy at worst. And gradually I'd remembered that I had read that phrase not on the Zapruder film before. And where did I read it? I read it in the testimony of Lyndall Shaneyfeld, who was the FBI agent who helped restage the assassination for the Warren Commission in May 1964. To their surprise, when they started having the car follow the path of the presidential limousine, they discovered that the president's upper torso came into Oswald's line of sight at a point before the Zapruder film restarted. And they labeled this position A and defined it as the first point at which a person in the sixth floor window could have gotten a shot at the president after the limousine rounded the corner. That led me to wonder, what exactly is the source for the contention that Zapruder filmed the whole assassination? And it turned out to be a conversation between Abraham Zapruder and Richard Stolle on that terrible night of November 22nd, 1963. Stolle had arrived in Dallas. He heard from a stringer here that a, name, a man by the name of Zapruder had filmed the assassination. He called him up at something like 11.30 and asked him four questions. Did you film the assassination? Yes. Do you have that film? Yes. Can I see it now? No. And then he asked him, did you photograph the assassination from beginning to end? And Zapruder said yes. And this was an honest answer because from Zapruder's point of view, when he started restarted his camera, the president was alive and waving to the crowd, and by the time his film ended, the president was dead. So from Zapruder's film uh, perspective, of course, he had filmed the whole assassination. But we know from the raw notes taken by Darwin Payne, a reporter for the Dallas Times-Herald, something very important. Payne worked about five blocks from Dealey Plaza, he was there within 20 minutes of the assassination. The second person he interviewed worked for Abraham Zapruder and told him, my boss has film. The third person Darwin Payne interviewed was Abraham Zapruder. And this page reflects what Zapruder told him. I got film. The president slumped, slumped over with the first shot. The first shot, he bent over and grabbed his throat. The second of two shots hit him in the head. He couldn't be alive. She was beside him. After the last shot, she crawled over the back of the car. And what is apparent here is that the Zapruder, like some people in Dealey Plaza, only heard two shots. And what he is describing as the first shot was actually the second shot fired. And the second shot to Zapruder was the third shot fired. What does this mean visually? This is a frame from a Secret Service film and photos taken on November 27th, 1963, five days after the assassination. This was a restaging done not for criminal investigative purposes, but to show agents back in Washington what had happened. Now the car, I mean the real car there, is approximately position A as established by the Warren Commission, the point at which the president's upper torso becomes 
apparent to a person in the sixth floor window. The ghost car is the car when Zapruder started filming it. So he didn't film that whole turn and he didn't film until the car was approximately 72 feet into Dealey Plaza. And I was able to interest Nat Geo in this question and they helped me corroborate the idea that there was a shot off the Zapruder film. And the first thing I thought is this is true, there must be eyewitnesses. Maybe not everybody, certainly not everybody in Dealey Plaza, but there are going to be some people who associate the shot with a point in space that is not on the Zapruder film. And the first one I found, and it wasn't too difficult, was Amos Ewens. He was a 15-year-old high school student whose mother had dropped him off in Dealey Plaza. And that afternoon he told the Sheriff's Department, and in every subsequent interview, he always said that the first shot happened when the car got near a black and white sign. And we were able to get him involved in the Nat Geo documentary. And you see on the right that same still from the Secret Service. Now Zapruder, I mean, I'm sorry, Ewens was around that peristyle. It's not in the still. But the black and white sign that he mentioned in his statement he pointed it out to me in the documentary, and it's outlined there in red. We had to make a mock-up of it because it had long been taken down. It was the U.S., those old U.S. highway badge signs, black and white. And I developed other eyewitnesses. In fact, I'm still developing eyewitnesses. Take, for example, Pierce Allman. Now, this is a still from the Dorman film. This is the only film from the Texas School Book Depository. It's running when Zapruder's film isn't. Unfortunately, she was not a good amateur filmmaker, and the film is very jumpy and almost useless for investigative purposes. Pierce Allman is the man on the right. Now, if you look again at that still from the Secret Service restaging, you have two men standing almost exactly in front of the steps where Pierce Allman and his colleague from WFAA were standing. And in 2013, an enterprising journalist asked Pierce Allman to stand in that same position and describe what had happened, what he had seen. And he said to that journalist, at the time of the first shot, they were right about with the lamppost. Well, there's a lamppost not three feet from the black and white sign that Amos Ewens had identified. So I was able to establish at least some eyewitnesses could corroborate a, f a shot that occurred before the Zapruder film. Then we looked at the shells that had ex been expended from Oswald's rifle. They fell in a peculiar pattern. Two were near the windowsill, one was in the, towards the west. Now, it's a standard procedure in criminal ballistics that expended shell patterns can be used for investigative purposes because firearms are made to act repeatedly, uh, dependably. Nat Geo found a Marine reservist, Mac Burt, who was the same height as Oswald, same training, and we asked him to a mock-up, to participate in a mock-up of the assassination. Now, for the first shot, his rifle was per almost perpendicular to the window, and the shell casing came right toward us. But when he moved slightly for shots two and three, the casings, the expended cartridges, bounced against the cartons that Oswald had stacked in order to hide himself from anyone, and they bounced right towards the sill. We must have done this 20 times, and 17 or 18 times the expended cartridges fell in exactly the pattern that was found. So we had some corroboration of uh, eyewitnesses. The earwitness testimony, of course, was overwhelmingly in favor of a first shot before the Zapruder film started. The pattern of the cartridges also fit. But it turned out that the Zapruder film itself impeaches the Zapruder film. Now, most of the people who developed the consensus view of what had happened looked 
to the president and Governor Conley, their reactions to the first shot. And of course, they're looking on the Zapruder film for their reactions to shots on the Zapruder film, which is a fallacy right there. The place, though, to really look is at the Queen Mary, the Cadillac that was right behind the Lincoln Continental. This was the car that had been formerly the presidential limousine. Here at the Sixth Floor Museum, there's an oral history with a man named Malcolm Summers. You see him circled here after the fatal shot to President Kennedy. And he described how, as they came around, the Secret Service people reacted to what he thought had been a firecracker. They looked down at the ground. I think they thought it was a firecracker, too. The car kept coming, and there was a second shot, and then a third. We don't have time to play this, but if you look at the movements of George Hickey, who was the agent sitting on the driver's side of the bench seat of the Cadillac, at frame 147, he starts to look way over to his left. And in his statement, he talks about how he thought a firecracker had been tossed against the side of the Cadillac, and he was looking for it. Now, frame 147 is about a second before the consensus view about when the first shot was fired. But of course, Hickey's reaction is immediate, what they call a mediated reaction. The rifle wasn't fired against his ear. He had to recognize it as a sound that didn't belong. And then his brain had to tell his muscles to move, and then his muscles had to move. And all that took, you know, a few seconds, a second and a half or a second. But he's clearly reacting to something that has already happened and long before, long being a second, before people said the first shot had been fired. <clears throat> now, once you're, we're no longer spellbound by the Zapruder film, we can reconsider the ballistic issues. Why did the first shot miss so badly? Not only miss President Kennedy, but everybody in the car and the car itself. And what about these unexplained ballistic phenomena associated exclusively with the first shot? Well, here is here is a picture of the concrete skirt that was the point of first impact of the errant shot. I say skirt, but actually it was the turf that was disturbed. And no one could find anything because, of course, turf can't stop a bullet traveling probably at well, less than its exit velocity from the rifle, but still with a lot of power. Here is the mark on the curb on South Main that the policeman noticed soon after noticing James Tay had a cut on his cheek. This is a picture that shows the curb and James Tague's position. Tag was roughly where the um, those two men were a little four, three to four feet in front of the abutment, and that other uh, circled bag or cardboard box is where the curb hit strike was. And here's a picture of James Tag with just this little cut on his cheek. Now, the question is, what is going to cause a bullet to go so errant? In the restaging of the assassination that was done on November 27th, it was more or less directed by a Secret Service agent named John Joe Howlett, who was a very young, college-educated agent in the Dallas field office. And he had the car, he filmed the car, or the stand-in car, on various passes through Dealey Plaza, once traveling at the right of speed that the president had traveled at, another time much slower. But then he did something that was quite brilliant. He put the camera in the car and pointed it up to the window. And you realize very dramatically that there are only two obstacles to Oswald's clear line of sight in Dealey Plaza. One is the tree, of course, but the other is this two-inch pipe that held the signal light at Elm and Houston. <clears throat> now, as part of the Nat Geo show, we were able to inspect that arm mast for the very first time. And on that lift with me was John Joe Howlett and Frank Deranger, who was the retired chief of the metallurgical unit of the FBI lab. <clears throat> now, Frank 
coincidentally and entirely coincidentally, his first posting in the FBI was in the Dallas field office in 1964, and the agent who showed him the ropes was Jim Hostie, but he played no role in the investigation of the assassination. The only thing really he had to do with it is when the phone rang and Marie Marguerite Oswald was on the other end as the low man in the totem pole, he had to talk to her. <clears throat> now as part of the Nat Geo show, we inspected the uh, mast, but really it wasn't a thorough forensic inspection. Frank and I both knew that we had not engaged in a thorough inspection. So after the show came out in November 2011, we started writing the FBI, asking them to consider taking down the mast so that it could be uh, inspected as one would if one was conducting a forensic examination. And we did this for about six months, and then one morning I got a call or an email from Gary Mack of the Sixth Floor Museum telling me that a car had hit the signal light. Now this had always been our worst fear, because we thought if it, the signal light, there was no curb there, there was a lot of traffic, someday the car's going to knock it down, they're going to haul it away, throw it in the trash, and we'll never had our chance to inspect it. We had pestered the street services department here often enough, and Gary knew of our interest that it wasn't thrown away. And we immediately made a beeline for Dallas and inspected the arm mast. It was 103 degrees that day, and we were out day, uh, outside all day. Eventually, the Dallas Parks and Recreation Department put the mast arm in a shed, and we were able and built us a fixture so we could see it at eye level. Now, one of the advantages of the Nat Geo show was that we had been able for the first time to establish the angles of deflection, presumably, from the sixth floor window to the mast arm, to the concrete skirt, and down to the concrete curb. And these were our guidelines for an inspection. However, and I can't go to, into all the details, we never found a footprint that we felt we could say this is it. So we started to approach the problem from another perspective. We're looking for a needle in a haystack. What does the needle look like? And in fact, is the arm capable of deflecting a bullet at the proper angles? We went back to H.P. White, which had conducted the test for CBS in 1967, and fortunately their president had a historical sense of the importance of resolving this if possible. And he gave us the use of their facilities, and I think it was three or four technicians for a day, which ordinarily cost thousands of dollars. And we were able to take a Mandlicker Carcano rifle and shoot it at exemplars. Now, it's extremely difficult to control the point of impact. A sixteenth of an inch makes a tremendous amount of difference. But on test number three, we were able to achieve a deflection as opposed to a shattering of the bullet. And in the angles measured by the technicians, it did fit closely with what we had established to be the angles of deflection for the first shot. And finally, we decided that really the last 22 to 30 inches of the arm mast was the most likely area of impact. And in fact, there was one area of slight indentation, but the fact is, we were conducting an examination that was about 49 years after the fact. Now, if the Warren Commission had been able to think beyond the Zapruder film, they might have come up with this scenario, we believe, which is a scenario we developed. Oswald fired the first shot just after President Kennedy reached position A. He thought he could get a shot off before the arm mast interfered, but he didn't. He couldn't fire in that space between before the president got to the tree because you can't work the bolt action rifle fast enough. He had to wait, and that's where the pause came in. He had to wait until the president cleared the tree, and that's when shots two and three were fired. <clears throat> 
if you time this all out, the assassination actually took slightly in excess of 11 seconds, which is almost double the life scenario. Now let me just point out here that our explanation of what happened is the plausible one we believe, in fact the only plausible one for why the bullet didn't hit its mark when it was fired and where it went. But you don't really have to believe it. You can believe that Oswald fired in the air to scare the pigeons off the roof. You can believe he had a bad case of buck fever and that he fired errantly into the asphalt, but somehow no one saw the kind of volcanic little eruption that would occur if a bullet traveling at that velocity hit asphalt. But what you do have to believe is that the Zapruder film only captured the second and third shots. By his own account, Abe Zapruder only heard two shots, he only saw two shots, he only filmed two shots. Now why is this all important? I mean, on the one hand, it only underscores that Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated President Kennedy. It's actually congruent with the findings of the Warren Commission because they too entertained the possibility of the first shot that the first shot missed. They didn't believe it, but they entertained the possibility. Well, I believe it's crucial because if you look at the historiography of the criticism of the Warren Report, the questions start with how. How was able, Oswald able to do this? And that uncertainty, that volatility over how soon extended to all these theories about other people being involved for other reasons. And it was entirely within the Warren Commission's capacity to answer how. It was unlike the other two questions, which always had some element of speculation. I mean, if you believed Oswald did it, you know, you would have to speculate as why. I mean, you could have two different people could make two different arguments about why Oswald did it. You know, he's completely mentally imbalanced or he's a political, politicized sociopath. When I presented this finding to the Warren Commission staff, I was slightly taken aback at the reaction. Some regarded it as important, an important clarification of their work. Others labeled it a harmless error. That sort of a legal doctrine of an error, if an error takes place during a trial, but the evidence nevertheless is overwhelming that the defendant is either innocent or guilty, it's a harmless error, it really doesn't matter. Well, I don't think it was a harmless error, as I say. The Warren Commission had to answer three questions. Why hinged on who, and who was contingent on how? And how was the only one that the commission had the complete power to absolutely resolve. That they didn't eroded their credibility. The assassination only happened one way, and they were unable to describe the one way it happened. Now today I visited the sixth floor of the museum, and to my surprise I saw a quote from Richard Stolle, who says, or had said at some point in the past, the Zapruder film proves almost anything you want it to prove. Now that's quite different from the first statement life made that the Zapruder film was the absolute perfect evidence, the time clock to the assassination. It's quite a concession that he's making and I totally disagree with it. The assassination happened only one way and the question is how did it happen? The Zapruder film cannot be privileged, it has to be woven into all the evidence. And once we break its spell and are no longer mesmerized by the Zapruder film, we realize that it does live up to what life claimed it was. It is a time clock of the assassination, but of an assassination that had already commenced. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll try and answer all, as many of these questions as I can. What motive would I assign to Oswald? My own view is that he was a politicized sociopath.
Um, he was very political ever since the Rosenberg case in the 1950s. And he considered himself in his own mind, like I said, a world historic figure. I think one of the most interesting things Norman Mailer did in his biographies, Oswald, is he took his diary, he cleaned up all the misspellings. Oswald was dyslexic and corrected all the grammar. And you see, actually, a person who's not unintelligent but struggling in a world that's, you know, in which he's gotten the short end of the stick. He's not an educated person, but yet he learned Russian. Not everybody could do that. I think he was motivated to kill President Kennedy first because in his own fevered imagination, the opportunity presented itself. Now, in the Warren Commission, they established that Oswald had bought his rifle to kill General Walker, who was an extremely right-wing general. And to the mindset of the Warren Commission, you know, how could someone who had all his marbles want to kill Walker, who was you know, to some view, uh, view of some an American Adolf Hitler in the making, and President Kennedy, a liberal president. Well, to Oswald's way of thinking, there wasn't that much difference between them. <clears throat> How do you explain the instant stopping of Rosemary Willis? Um, well, I think it fits very well with what I tried to describe, that the first shot happened earlier before Zapruder restarted his camera. What about the girl in the red dress? That's Rosemary Willis. Um, after deflection from the light pole, you show the bullet deflecting into grass, past the manhole area, and continuing on to the curb and deflecting into tag. I don't actually believe the bullet deflected into tag, but um, that's more or less accurate. How does a bullet ricochet off grass? Well, I would leave that to Frank, who's here, because I am not a ballistic expert, but I'm sure he'd be happy to explain that after you. He's sitting right up front here. How did I become interested in this? That's a question I'm often asked. Um, of course, I was alive then. Um, I was in gym class when it happened. We went. We were soon excused from school. I, I grew up in Los Angeles. I went home, started watching the television, and I didn't shut it off until Monday. I was probably the only person in my family that did that. But I wasn't, when I went to Washington and became a journalist, I wasn't uh, all that absorbed. In fact, I was in Washington when the House Select Committee reinvestigated the assassination. I didn't follow that at all. My interest started with the Oliver Stone film, which was actually co-written by a person who had dated my sister, Zachary Sklar. And I'd been in Washington long enough to know that uh, if the CIA and the military industrial complex had been involved in eliminating President Kennedy, that J. Edgar Hoover would have been the first person and delighted in exposing that. The idea that the government, the federal government, which in many ways is, is dysfunctional, could be so coordinated was just the biggest political fantasy of them all. About uh, two or three days later, I was having breakfast with Victor Novasky, the editor of The Nation, where I then worked. And Victor had been very involved in the controversies over the Rosenberg and his cases. And I asked him, why uh, weren't you interested in the Kennedy assassination controversy, which is another big Cold War controversy? And Victor had actually written a book also about Robert Kennedy at the Justice Department, said, well, I went to Yale Law School with a fellow named Bert Griffin. And Bert Griffin is one of the most honest people I've ever met in my life. Bert was a staff lawyer for the Warren Commission. And if Bert didn't think it was incompetent or corrupt, I was not going to think so either. And that was the end of his interest. And then I started thinking, well, I wonder what the lawyers who worked on the Warren Commission thought of Oliver Stone's film. Most of them had stopped talking to journalists a long time ago because they were so upset over the kind of coverage that they had received. However, because of the film, I had this window of opportunity, and they, in some cases, unburdened themselves to me. They talked about how their own children or grandchildren by that time came up to them and said, how could you have done this? How could you have been part of this terrible cover-up? 
the murder of our president. And they were very upset. And gradually I understood that there was a tremendous story here because most times in Washington, if there's an investigating panel, someone breaks away and writes an expose of how the whole thing was incompetent and corrupt. That had not happened here. They were like men who had been through a war in the same foxhole, very tight-knit. Now, there were tensions between them and jealousies, but the fact is none of them had strayed off the reservation. And that's basically how I got interested in the assassination. Did Zapruder ever have an opportunity to sell the camera? Uh, not to my knowledge. The camera, I believe, is in the National Archives. If not a lone gunman, how do you keep that many people quiet? Example, Deep Throat Finally Exposed. Thank you. I did write a book about Mark Felt, also known as Deep Throat. And um, it also came from my understanding of how the Bureau operated, that Mark Felt was not a whistleblower and a patriot, but in fact he was a nasty, vicious man who leaked to the Washington Post to undermine the director of the FBI, the interim director, Pat Gray, because he wanted his job. And all this stuff about Mark Felt being a patriot and a principled man is quite off the mark. Any photos of life's car, LBJ's car at the corner? Yes, I believe the uh, James Altkin's photo, which is probably the most famous still of the assassination shows Johnson's car and I think in, in fact a door was opening because a Secret Service agent was trying to get out because he already knew shots were being fired. What about the woman who gave pictures of the film to the FBI about the grassy knoll having smoke from it? The film disappeared. What about the doctors at Parkland seeing the brains blown from front to back? What about the pristine bullet found on the gurney at Parkland? What about the BBC series on the men in Paraguay, uh, Paraguay admitting the assassination? Well, that's, that's enough of those questions. Well, the fact is that the president was at Parkland for a very short time. One of the tragic things, I suppose, was the press insisted on the doctors describing how the president had died. Now, they hadn't even turned him over. They didn't know there was a bullet wound in his upper back. So the doctor, whose name escapes me at the moment, I think it was Malcolm Perry, said he had noticed a wound on the president's, what he took to be an entrance wound in the president's throat. And that's what they had done to tracheotomy. He regretted that statement because he realized he shouldn't have made it. He shouldn't have made that speculative guess in the short time that he had seen the president. In fact, that was the exit wound of a military bullet, which you know city doctors didn't often see how they acted. But yet there are people who will never let that go. It was an entrance wound, and therefore there was a shot at the front. It's just flatly untrue. Um, the pristine bullet is another misnomer, of course. A pristine bullet is a bullet that doesn't actually hit anything at all. And that bullet that was found on the gurney is not pristine. It's heavily flattened on one side, and some of the lead is extruded from the base. Now, I didn't mention this during my talk, but one of the ways, the most extreme priv privileging of the Zapruder film is to say that you can tell the direction of the shots from the way the president acts or Governor Conley on the film. This is completely ridiculous. It's ridiculous because no one had ever seen what happens to a person when they're shot in the head with a high-velocity bullet because no one volunteers to be the subject of that kind of examination. The fact is the way you tell is by the beveling effect. And when they took out President Kennedy's brains at the Bethesda Naval Center, they noticed a beveling on the inside of his skull. So more, because more materials were moved on the exit uh, part of the surface. So the fact is the bullet entered from the rear. And it doesn't really matter 
how he acts because the bullet entered from the rear as established by the autopsy. I think that's all the questions. <laughs>